Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian from the Association of the United States Army's annual conference and trade show. And we're honored to have with us as our guest, uh, former congressman, uh, former Army officer, and now Under Secretary of the Army, Patrick Murphy. Sir, thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. My first AUSA uh, in this capacity working at the Pentagon. Um, I, uh, it, it, uh, it certainly is a, a very, very interesting time. I want to start off, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's a presidential election season. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, uh, discussion, obviously, about U.S. military capabilities, uh, particularly from the Republican uh, challenger, uh, Donald Trump, uh, as, as well as his supporters uh, about the condition of the military. Uh, yesterday, we heard uh, the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, Mark Milley. We also heard the uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense, Bob Work, uh, sort of uh, deliver the message, don't mess with uh, the U.S. military, particularly uh, red meat coming from the Army Chief of Staff uh, to the crowd. Is there a message here that you're trying to deliver to the world? Uh, I think we, we deliver a message every day. We have 1 million, 15,000 soldiers that are the best of the best, the greatest fighting force to ever walk this earth. I was proud to be uh, a soldier. Uh, I'm a soldier for life. Uh, and it is hard not to be inspired when you're around these great young Americans. But we are very clear. We are the best at what we do. And deterrence is what we're about. Because if they go toe-to-toe -to -toe with us, we will win and they will be destroyed. Um, that uh, is uh, you know, definitely a message to, to transmit, but there are also financial challenges here. Um, you know, over uh, the last number of years, one of the things that's said to have undermined U.S. military capabilities, obviously, is the Budget Control Act, um, you know, as well as Congress's inability to pass budgets. Uh, you were in Congress at, at the time when, when some of this madness was, was, was happening. Uh, now we, we do have a, a, f a funding measure. But how long can the Army go before, uh, you know, it needs a real budget under which to operate? You know, it's interesting. When I, I was obviously an Iraq veteran, two, two deployments, came back, ran for Congress in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, the first Iraq War veteran to serve in Congress, became an appropriator my second term in the Congress. When I left almost six years ago, our budget was about $100 billion more. So we've taken about a 46% cut. Uh, so we're downsizing, obviously, the military. We've done that in the civilian sector as well within our army. But uh, we are now um, positioned where we need to be uh, to basically execute the guidance given to us by Secretary of Defense and the Commander-in-Chief. Uh, but I will tell you, um, we have had to take some risk in modernization, some risk with installations uh, to make sure that we're pushing it all on readiness. And that means being ready to fight tonight that when we send our young men and women in harm's way, it's our solemn duty to make sure they are trained and equipped, and frankly, that they don't have a fair fight, that they have the technical and tactical advantage over our enemy. Do, do, does, a, does a CR in near term, you know, how long can you absorb, for example, a temporary funding measure before it starts to become a problem for the service? Yeah, this, when you have a CR, continuing resolution, you don't get the bang for your buck. You can't budget appropriately. So, you know, Secretary Fanning was, was very eloquent in, in, in what he said two days ago, and he said again yesterday to the congressional breakfast, that when you have a CR, what it does is it basically you're going after a budget from two years ago at this point. Um, we have to budget appropriately. You know, we are the United States military. We are the United States Army. We need the Congress. Their number one duty is to pass a budget. They control the purse strings of our country. So, you know, we need them to get after it when they get back after this election. Uh, and we have a temporary CR right now, but we need to pass the NDAA. We need to get after it, uh, and hopefully they will. Uh, Army's been working hard to determine what it looks like in the future. Obviously, there are some who want to maintain those counterinsurgency skills. For example, the, the likes of which you saw when you were in Iraq. There are those who say, look, it's time to forget about that nonsense and focus on the high-intensity fight. You guys, the whole Army leadership has been focused on the plan for what the Army of, of 2025 looks like. What does that force need to look like? to do what the nation needs it to do? Well, one, you know, we have to make sure that we keep our families safe and we win. And that does include the counterterrorism, counterinsurgency operations that we're doing right now. We need to take the fight to ISIS. We're doing it now in Iraq and in Syria while we still have to keep up the pressure and the fight against Al Qaeda in Afghanistan. Knowing that, we also have to anticipate where the next war, war might come from, from a near peer competitor when we're talking about Russia, China, Iran, or North Korea because the world is becoming more volatile, as are those countries. So when you see that, that high-end ground combat to ensure our soldiers are training for that high-end ground combat, including now, not just artillery and armor, but also EW, 
also cyber. We need to make sure our troops are trained for those high-end crown combat because um, we can't just be focused on what the war has been the last 15 years. And we also can't say, well, we're not going to do that anymore because we need to do that because ISIS is a threat to the safety of our country. How large does the Army have to be? Because historically the debate all too often becomes about the size of the force. Uh, General Milley uh, you know, has made it clear that, look, we have a million-man force, really, if you look at it with the Guard and, and the Reserve as well, not just the active duty force. Is the Army the right size right now? But we, we need to stay you know, at a million. Uh, we're a little bit over that now, a million to, to 15,000, but uh, we are a total Army. And for the last 15 years, you know, when I deployed months after 9-11 happened, and I deployed with then-Colonel Mark Milley, uh, who was our ground forces commander, you know, we were replaced, I was with the 25th Infantry Division, but we were replaced by the National Guard of the Pennsylvania National Guard, the 28th Infantry Division. So, you know, we've been fighting these wars, you know, as a total army. Uh, I thought, I think what uh, General Milley and, and Secretary Fanning has done is really incorporated the National Guard uh, and the reserve component that we are one army and make it very clear. If we're not all singing from the same sheet of music, you know, there's a lot of come to Jesus conversations that are going on out there because they better be singing because uh, it's very clear from the top and it's reaching the bottom of the organization. You know, we are one team in one fight. Uh, and I think you see that with our travel schedule. I think you see that when, you know, I'm, I'm out there and I go to National Guard units and I'm PTing with the Georgia National Guard and I'm, and I'm you know, PTing with the Army Reserve. It's important because that's how we're fighting. Let me take you to a question on innovation because I know our time is tight. Um, you know, you're focused on innovation, obviously the department is, it is the hot topic, but give us some concrete examples of what the United States Army is doing to change how it does business. We, we, there is a new leadership team in place and we are getting after it when we talk about every dollar counts. And part of that innovation, innovation means collaboration. So we just launched at AUSA, we've been working on it for months, we just released it, the AI2 program. Uh, AI2 is Army Ideas for Innovation. And that means we're crowdsourcing ideas from the force, from the soldiers, from the civilians, saying, what ideas do you have? So I was just talking to you know, General Rapp yesterday, who's the commandant uh, at the War College, and I've known him for, for over a decade, I, I served with him, you know, and saying, hey, I need to do student, students. You know, I, it's great they're doing these thesis papers, that they're doing these doctor's programs, but you know, I need to put them to put their paper uh, on this, put it out there, and then soldiers could comment on it. Yes, no, maybe so. You know, that crowdsourcing, that, that ideas is important. And, it's, and again, General Patton once said, and it's one of my favorite quotes, he said, loyalty, people talk about loyalty from the bottom to the top. Rarely do you see loyalty from the top to the bottom. And what the AI2 program is doing is saying, we are loyal to, we want to hear your ideas. And if they're good ideas, we want to implement them. Um, and whether it was the sleeves up thing, it's a small thing that you know, General Milley you know, did, and Sergeant Major, or whether it's, you know, getting rid of the newspapers that sat there uh, at the Pentagon that we were paying over $50,000 for. Um, and we said we could just do it digital. I mean, this is you know, a new leadership team, and I think you're seeing it through the innovation. I think you're seeing it through the Every Dollar Counts program. I think you're seeing it through Lean Sigma Six. As you know, I'm the Chief Management Officer of the Army, so I'm running the business operations. You know, I just was with 10 great civilians and soldiers that saved the American taxpayer, saved our Army in cost savings, $1.3 billion. It's a big deal. You know, people say, you know, I'm the initiative for Soldier for Life. You know, Soldier for Life is the right thing to do for our soldiers to make sure they have the proper transition. Because frankly, when I left in 2004 from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, after my second deployment, I went home to Pennsylvania. I, there wasn't a transition program. There wasn't Soldier for Life TAP program. Now there is. And now that program starts 12 months ahead of time. So we went from four years ago paying over $515 million a year in unemployment benefits, even though frankly, the VA and the Department of Labor were responsible for the transition. We're, we're on the hook for the funding of it. So $515 million a year to this year, $185 million. So $330 million in savings by investing, by focusing our soldiers and our team on Soldier for Life, that you are a leader, character for a lifetime of service. So these programs that are saving us money, and because, as we said earlier, with a 46% cut with $100 billion left, less that we're dealing with than when I used to appropriate for the Army six years ago, we need to do more with less. Because frankly, six years ago, we didn't have Russia invading other countries, we didn't have ISIS, and we didn't have the issue with the South China Sea and with North Korea. How much more savings do you think you can wring out of the budget with initiatives like this? We're talking billions. Because every day I wake up and say, what more can I do 
to, to get money so I could push it into modernization, so we could push it in installations, so we could push it on readiness programs to make sure that our soldiers do not have a fair fight, that they have a technical and tacti tactical advantage over enemy, and to get that to doubling the rotations for the combat training center rotations that we're doing now with the National Guard. We're, we are sending a message, and we are unison. We are a tight leadership team in the Army. We are in unison that we have to do this together, and we have to you know, figure out how to make every dollar count as well. Let me ask you about an innovation metrics question really quickly. Um, how are you going to, you know, everybody talks about innovation. They want innovation. You're obviously finding a mechanism right through social media to disseminate these ideas and get soldiers mm -hmm. to, to vote on them effectively. But what is the metric that you use, whether or not ultimately an idea is good enough to be broadly adopted? Is it a popularity contest that soldiers say that they like it? What are some of the nitty gritty ways you're going to make sure that when you embrace an idea, it's, you know, it strategic fits and works. Yeah, well, listen, it, part of it is you get what you measure. So as a soldier, you know, I, I look at it through a soldier's eyes. You know, how is this going to relate to that 11 Bravo, that soldier, that trigger puller, you know, that, that I used to serve with. Um, and, and knowing that and coming from that foundation that, you know, when I joined the Army when I was 19, and, you know, that was obviously several decades ago, you know, when I, when I have that experience and I look at these things and I, I walk you know, at AUSA, and I went to 30 exhibits already in these three days, and I'm talking, I'm, I'm out there and I'm kicking the tires, and I'm doing what's necessary to, to see, it. and it's not just here, it's, I'm going out um, to AMC, and I was down in Alabama, and I'm Fort Bragg and Fort Hood, and et cetera. The, the, the point is, though, it's, it's not a popularity, kind of, it, this, isn't, this isn't, you know, America's Got Talent. You know, this is United States Army, and this is serious business, uh, but that doesn't stop us from asking soldiers and saying, hey, how did you, and looking, you know, fielding this thing and NIE and things where I've been and when they're doing it, sometimes they're saying, hey, this is just, it's too much. And we have to take that feedback. You know, my wife kindly reminds me sometimes more often than I would like that God gave me two ears, but only one mouth for a reason. <laughs> so we're out there, we're listening to soldiers um, and we love them and we want to make sure that we're empowering them. Very last question, you're from Pennsylvania. Uh, USS Jack uh, P. Murtha is going to be uh, commissioned over the weekend in Philadelphia. W what does it feel to, what does it feel like as a, you know, Pennsylvanian uh, fellow lawmaker, you serve with Jack Murtha, Chairman Murtha. What's it, how does it feel to have a ship I, named after him? I, I will be there, I, I, I couldn't be more proud. He, he was my, my mentor when I was in Congress. Uh, I think many of you know he's a Korean War veteran, he's a Marine, but also the first Vietnam veteran to, to serve in the US Congress. Um, he took me under his wing because I was the first Iraq War veteran, and we were both from Pennsylvania. And I will tell you, uh, him and his wife Joyce are, are a great American family. He has done so much for our military. Um, he had not just a great intellect uh, and a great heart, but he had the moral courage to stand up and do what was right every time. And you know, when I taught at West Point, you know, we used to, I used to tell the cadets that character, because we're all about duty, honor, country, and um, I used to say character is how you are when no one is looking. Uh, and when no one was looking, Jack Murtha was always there for our military because he loved us. Uh, and we loved him right back. And I will be there for that ship this Saturday. Thanks very much. Look forward to seeing there you as well, sir. And best of luck on this last day of AUSA. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.